Welcome, Jessica, to the show. Love Jessica. Talk Radio. I want to welcome Jessica to the show. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your wonderful story with our listeners because what you do is very unique and I think all of us have something to learn. So thank you. Hello, Lisa, and hello to all the listeners. Thank you for having me and I'm excited to share my story today. Oh, good, good, good. All right, so let's start. I mean, in the introduction, I talked a little bit about your background and, and what you're currently doing. You started a limited liability corporation a while back. Tell us a little bit about that and why you decided to go that route, why you decided to set up a limited liability corporation. Okay, so um, first of all, I I was always very connected with sports. I played sports my whole life growing up and then in the in the on the tour and then in school but my masters and my studies was more connected with business and international relations and so um I kind of wanted to to combine those two those two backgrounds that I had but I didn't get a a chance to get hired by any by any job and since um I wanted to stay here in the U.S. I had this idea of start my own company and combine my two backgrounds, which is sport and um, international relations. And so that's when I started Jesse Way LLC. And what is Jesse Way's mission statement? What are you hoping to accomplish through the LLC? Well, um, we hope to accomplish to use sport as an engine for social and economic development. And so we have passion for sport, and we we offer personal personalized training for every level, and athletic consulting to individuals and nonprofits and sport venues and schools and other businesses. But the main idea behind it is to use sport um, and help develop the societies and the people in general. It's interesting. I I watch a lot of TED Talks. I don't know if you've watched any of those or if any of the listeners are into that. I'm kind of addicted, actually. But I watched yeah. one the other day um, that was done by a young man from Somalia, and he was talking uh-huh. about how entrepreneurship was the key to reducing terrorism in, in his country and how mm-hmm. entrepreneurship is viewed as a way out for some of these young people who, like you, find themselves unable to get hired by a company and they're so desperate and the terrorist organizations have come in and lured them with money and cars and all sorts of things. But now that entrepreneurship is becoming more of a way out for these young people so they aren't forced to turn to terrorism to to survive... And I wonder if, you know, if your idea of economic development, if you thought about it in terms of keeping kids involved in school, keeping them out of gangs, I mean, is that the type of economic development you're talking about or is it something different? Right. Um, it's you, You're you're right at it, for sure. Um, sport, I believe sport has, has this magic of, of – putting people in the right direction and, and through sport you can learn honesty and teamwork and fair play and, and respect to yourself and respect to others and adhere to rules and and patience and responsibilities and those are things that sport teaches you and that if you teach those to other to other kids, especially the young ones, they can use that for their ongoing life and and I saw that in my in my life, how sport taught me everything I know today. And and I know in in other countries that's the same case. I I'm working with a um, with a academy in Africa, and uh, they teach tennis to their kids, and 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 then they eventually bring them over to the United States and have them um, participate in college here. So. So, yes, that's exactly right what you're saying. That's awesome. I just, I mean, to me, it makes so much sense 
and you know I think our our political leaders have a lot to learn from people like you who are being creative and trying to find ways to help kids find healthy outlets and you know ways to be successful in life in a legal manner as opposed to getting involved in gangs or in drug cartels or terrorist organizations. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's right. crazy. Um, right, and, and and so so many times um, in, in the way of helping or developing countries, people just tend to um, give them money or give them food, and the idea about, for my company, was teaching them how to fish instead of just giving them everything. And and by teaching them a sport and teaching them how they can have to concentrate to practice it and how that will take them to another level, that's the whole that's the whole idea. I love it. I totally love it. <laughs> and so so from Jesse Way you developed this whole idea of Dream Court. Tell us a little mm-hmm. bit about how that came to be. So um, I I am living right now in a um, town in Montgomery, in uh, Alabama, which is called Mon- Montgomery. Um, and I have been introduced to the Miracle League, which is an, which is a a league that is specifically designed for kids with disability to play baseball. And uh, when I saw this this baseball field. Um, for these kids, and I saw their program, and I saw what they do, I said, well, this is awesome, and I fell in love with the idea, and I said, we should definitely do something like this for tennis. And that's when I started research online, and I found I found this, this many places in the U.S. who were already using tennis for kids with disabilities to play, and um, I just decided to do something like that in Montgomery. And so tell us step by step what you had to do to get Dreamport functioning. What you know, how did it what what was the first step you had to do in terms of you know, did you have to get permission from the city and how did you find right. court and funding and all of that? Well, first what I the first thing I really did was I started to research more about um, Special Olympic and which were the activities that were already in place in Montgomery. I had really no background in um, intellectual or physical disability. So the first thing I really did was go to the Therapeutic Recreation Center and I volunteered there um, just, just to get an idea of how these how this individuals are, where they go, what they do. Um, how they react, and, and just to learn more about the persons and, and their families. And then I researched about the programs that were already in place to make sure that we don't step into anybody's program already. And when I learned more about that, um, I went to the city and I presented them the project, and I said, this is this would be great for the city, and um, I explained to them that if I could build a tennis court um, here, I could start a program like that and, and that would be beneficial for the city. And the, the city liked the program and they donated a piece of land and then they said, here here it is, um, the, if if you ever construct this tennis court, tennis court is going to be for the city, but you can develop your program there. And so the next step, what I did was just, um, was mainly learn about the other programs in, in the U.S. And, and see what I could copy from them, what what was the things that they did that I liked and which are the things that I thought were not beneficial for the program here. Um, and then the the second thing I did was organize a big kickoff celebration party. And so I invited the the people from Montgomery, mainly business owners and and uh, leaders who were already known in the city and invited them to come to this to this event and, and explain them what I was about to do. Um, in this kickoff celebration party, I invited one of the directors of the program from Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, his name is um, Jim Ham, and uh, he's the director of Special Pops, which is a um, an adaptive tennis program of Atlanta that 
surf to 700 tennis play, 700 athletes. And so he came down here and explained to my, give a little speech to 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 the people that attended that party of what this program was supposed to be and and how great it was going to be for Montgomery. Um, that was in May this year, and, and not even two months later, I had already raised over $150,000 $150, for the construction of, of the first court. Um, after that, I, uh, I convinced a 12 leaders from Montgomery to be on the, on the board of this new nonprofit, and then I filed for the 501c3 application, which is the legal papers, and from there we're li- growing little by little. And have you built your first court yet? No, actually, um, we haven't yet. We we have the plans from the engineers, and we're working strictly with parks and recreation, but um, I've also applied for a grant from USTA to um, sponsor part of the construction, and we are in the process of of getting the approval or or waiting for for our response. We cannot exactly break ground before we have acceptance, and if we don't get it, well, then we'll just go ahead and build it ourselves. <laughs> and what's your budget to build the court? Um, the initially it was about hundred and. Fifty thousand for two tennis courts, mm-hmm. um, and we we already raised that money, so so we should be good to go. That's fantastic. That's really fantastic. Yes. And so the it city. Was, is, go ahead. Um, it was it was a big um, concern of mine whether we should even even build this tennis court or not, because the tennis court for an adaptive tennis program is not any different than any other tennis court in the world. They they have the same um the same materials, they're hard courts, um, the same lines, the same colors, everything is the same about it. And so it was a big question whether I should just go ahead and use the public facilities from the from the Montgomery and start the program there. But at the same time, um I thought it would be neat for the nonprofit to have a place to be and to and for the kids who participate in the program to say that's our court. Whereas other courts are always gonna get um other participants first. They they have um leagues and tournaments and this and that and, and so these two tennis courts are gonna be specifically for the non profit. But if we ever grow out of those two tennis courts we can we might be able to use other courts in the city. That's great. That's great. So what's the specific mission statement of Dream Court? The, okay, so first it's to construct and maintain a tennis court, which meets the, the, the requirements for persons with physical and intellectual disabilities. Um, but then the the... The main mission is to enrich the lives of individuals with intellectual and physical disabilities through the sport of tennis. And so we we hope to serve and help and change lives through it. So the Special Pops program that's here in Atlanta, my understanding is just for uh, children and adults with intellectual disabilities. But Dream Court mm-hmm. also includes those with physical disabilities can you talk to us a little bit about the challenges that that presents for you as an organizer, but also as a coach for, you know, mixing mm-hmm. a, our two very different populations, right? Yes, that's right. Mm-hmm, that's right. So in intellectual fi- people with intellectual disabilities are usually kids that have Down syndrome or are autistic or delayed development or, or learning disabilities, which is one category, and they they fall into this special Olympic. Whereas on the other side, we have um, the physical disabled ones, which are usually ca- people that are amputees or are in a wheelchair or have hearing and vision and birth defects. 
and those compete in the Paralympics. Now, these these two um, these two populations are very different, but at the same time, they both of them don't fit into a a regular sport or a regular tennis um, camp or a regular tennis clinic or a regular tennis. Um, just programs, and so I thought that both of them deserve a chance. In fact, um, I have a good friend that I met when I was working up up north in Boston one summer, and he had a big ski accident. And he was a he was a, a great athlete, and 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 he played sport in school, and he was running and, and enjoying sports when I met him, and he had a big ski accident, and he's now in a quadriplegic and in the wheelchair, and, and that was one of the main reasons that it pushed me to say, this is what I want to do, and and so I I know that these two populations don't necessarily match um, in one clinic, but what we try to do is put them on separate courts, and so they still get the attention that they deserve, and and improve their tennis and their health and their lifestyle. So tell us, what does it look like when, if I were to come out and watch a Dream Court clinic in action, what would I see? Mm -hmm. Well, you would see um, uh, a lot of people beside the, the, the Dream Court athletes that come and those are our volunteers who who are helping out for the program to work. Volunteer at, volunteers for the Dream Court um, are not necessarily tennis players, or not necessarily knowing how 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 to play tennis. But they they do love either the sport or the, or they love the disability people, and so they come they come out there. And what we do is we have one one volunteer for each athlete who help them to go from from place to place and then we have just people that toss them balls and and have them hit some balls. But we mainly start at the beginning with with um just introducing ourselves. So we make a big a big circle and uh everybody says their names, whether it's an athlete or a co- or a volunteer. And then um we start tossing a ball to each other to see who is able to catch the ball, who is able to to hear, who is able to follow directions, and and from there we then go to just triple balls or just ball balance a, a ball on a racket and and just simple simple things like that, and and then we go to actually hit a couple of balls and. And so on. <laughs> That's so cool. So, so what is the difference in the challenges in working with intellectually disabled athletes versus physically disabled athletes? Um. Well, the the inte- with the intellectual ones, we have to be very very patient and and very very specific and very simple with our instructions and and also we we really try to to make them feel a success just because they don't feel this in 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 their other areas of their lives and they don't they don't necessarily they don't usually play sports too and so our goal is mainly to to get them out of of their house and and have them interacting with with other people and 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 volunteers, but on the physical disability, it it's mainly to it's it's a little bit more competitive already. So they they um they 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 might be people that were athletes before they had their accident or or yeah. <laughs> so so with the the physically disabled ones um you're mm-hmm. already seeing that that they come at this with a more competitive outlook whereas for the intellectually disabled athletes 
it's more about fun and learning a new skill and and that's right. Social. Yeah. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned that your volunteers are a big part of your program. Can you tell us a little bit about how you go about recruiting volunteers? How old do they have to be and what kind of training they receive? Yes. Um our our volunteers can be can be as as young as ten years old, but they can also they uh, and they 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 range from a, from every ages and uh, what I mainly did I I went to the different universities that we have here and uh, encouraged their tennis teams to participate. So we had um, participation from from Auburn University at Montgomery. We had participation from ASU players, we had a participation from Huntington players, um, and so those were a huge help because they obviously had already a good tennis level of skills and, and, and they were ready to, they didn't need that much instruction. Um, also the, the high school kids were great volunteers because they also had the tennis background and and so forth. Now, other type of volunteers is is mainly people who just like the idea of helping others and and uh, and enjoy the fact of of making somebody else happy that day. Um, our we we have some training for them. We we have an we have slideshows and we have little magazines where we teach the people how to relax and. And um, how to just interact with the, with with these people because they cannot really make a mistake by by coming out and play with them. But yeah, I mean, I think that it's got to be so rewarding for the volunteers to know, like you said, that they're just coming out and making somebody happy that day. I mean, what what better thing? Yeah, than like there, that's awesome. Yeah, and volunteering with Imcord is really. Fun. It's really fun and rewarding, and and for both for the athletes and for the volunteers, and 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 the whole the whole part of of including volunteers and the athletes is it's to it's to have um, it's to unify. It's to have the inclusion. If you if you tell somebody, they'll they'll forget. If you Teach. Sometimes they they will remember, but if you involve them, they they learn and they and they have a different experience about the whole the whole idea. And and that holds true for the athletes and the volunteers, is what you're saying? Yes. Sorry. So that that concept of of being involved and changing people's outlook that's for the athletes, but it's for the volunteers too. Yes, that's right. Um and, and also for for the parents of the athletes. Um sometimes they sometimes the, the parents of these athletes don't really get to talk to other parents or 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 other people with this with their same with their same challenges. But in this case they come out here and they they meet the other parents and they meet the the parents of the kids that play on a normal league of tennis and and they they enjoy that too right right so do you have any athletes involved in your program that have a brother or sister that's in i i don't know what to call it other than normal tennis program i don't, I don't know what the mm-hmm. political term is for for yes not. yes um we do we we do have athletes that have that have brothers or sisters in in the regular tennis clinics and and uh, that that's that's a big idea for for these families too. I mean, tennis is just tennis is is very tennis is very fun and and it's something that the whole family can enjoy and it's something that that um, they can they can do together and so if if the if the regular athletes or the regular child already plays tennis and now the disabled one plays too then the mom and the dad can have a whole day together with them right right well so 
tell us, do you have any stories that you can share with us about specific volunteer experiences or athlete experiences to give the listeners a better feel for what it's like to be in in this program or to be around Dream Court? Because I had, you know, my first experience, not with Dream Court, but with Special Pops Atlanta. And, I, I mean, it's just, it's a phenomenal thing that goes on and, and the amount of joy and the amount of excitement and the lack of, of nastiness that we tennis mm-hmm. parents are used to seeing in competitive tennis environments. I mean, it's just, it's night and day. So I would love for you to, to share any stories you might have. Yeah, well, um, I have a couple of stories. First, one of the stories that I would like to share is when I teach at the at the Montgomery Country Club, which is where I teach now, um, I have I have sometimes kids that even though they are happy, sometimes they they don't get as excited to be out there. It's it, it the tennis becomes such a routine, and then they feel that they have to go to school and that they have to come to tennis after, and and it's all like this dragging thing where I always have to find ways to motivate them. Whereas on the dream court. It's it's something where these kids look forward to go. They they really they really want to be there in, in that day. And then um, another story is when when I teach the kids from from the country club, I am their coach and I'm their teacher. And once the clinic is over, I put them in my car and we drive to the dream court. And then I tell them, well now you are not my athlete anymore. Now you are the coach. And 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 they have this feel of responsibility all of a sudden, and they change their whole attitude. They they pass from being kids or, or, or not picking up the ball to all of a sudden be this adult on the other side and, and, and be a real coach for, for, for these other kids. And, and I think that's just, that's just neat how that transformation happens within a cup from a couple of minutes to the next one. Um, so, another story. Sorry. Let me, let me interrupt you one second. So I didn't realize you did that. So when you coach the kids at the Montgomery Country Club, part of yeah. your coaching with them is to then take them to Dream Court and have them volunteer with you. Well, it just happened that that some of these some of the kids that I coach are interested in the dream court or their parents are or their parents were um sponsored the event. So so yes, we have the the Dream Court fall program now once one one night a week and and I drive straight from my normal work to to the Dream Cold Fall program, and some of the kids that I teach, I just take them in my car and uh, and take them to the fall program for the Dream Cold. Yes, <laughs> that's fantastic. I'm wondering, did you get any kind of resistance from the country club or from the parents at all, or or has everybody been very supportive of that? Um, well, I I really don't take the whole the whole group from the country club, it's just those who, who want to be part of the Dream Court and who want to help. So, so those ones who are coming are very supportive and they're very excited and, and and they love it. Yeah. That's awesome. That is so awesome. All right. So I'm sorry I interrupted you. You were going to tell us another story. So share. <laughs> I love these. So so another little story is when, um, when we had our our – summer program um one of our kids or one of our athletes had a maxwell t-shirt which is the air force here in montgomery and uh i see his t-shirt and and i tell him wow that's when i went to school and um and he he says that he went to he that he goes to school there too and he was really excited that we had something in common and so I tell him to follow the conversation. I said, "So you you have many friends there?" And um, he he thinks a little bit about it, and then he goes, "No, not not too many. I don't have many friends there." But he turns around and he points to one of the the volunteers, and he says, "But that is my friend." Oh. 
that volunteer <laughs> was one of my students of the Montgomery Country Club. He He's a very good player who who is um, ranked nationally and who is on the team at, at his high school. And, and he's a very neat kid, but he had never thought that this new person that he only met a couple of minutes before was going to refer to him as his friend. And so he had to think for it for a couple of minutes, and then he says, yeah, yes, I, I am your friend. And so that was very neat for me because I, I felt that, two different people who would have never met if it wasn't for the dream court all of a sudden felt that they had some connection through tennis and and I just value that. I have to tell you I just got goosebumps. I and I'm, I'm I'm tearing up. This is this is why you do what you do and it's and this is why tennis is such an awesome awesome sport because it affords people these types of opportunities and experiences and oh my gosh Jess this is this is so cool I just I love yeah. your stories I do <laughs> well, tell our listeners because I wrote about the special pops tournament here and um I wrote about it for parenting aces but I want them to hear from you what that experience was like coming here as a coach with one of your dream court athletes Oh wow, it was it was amazing. I um I I had researched special talks before a lot and I have been in contact with their director um to find out which what exactly to do with the program here in Montgomery and I had gone to Atlanta to visit their their practices but as ne- I didn't experience what I experienced that week uh, that weekend where where they organized this amazing big tournament with over 150 athletes from different places of of the U.S. And they were so organized and they had it so under control that I just I was just re- relaxed and hoped that my that my athlete had the best time and and she did. She um the athlete that I took to to play the the tournament had had only played five times in her life before and so. She was even excited when she saw those tennis courts. She, when she started to play tennis with the dream court, um, she didn't know what this sport was about. She had never held a racket before. She saw, she saw those only tennis courts where there was once what where she was practicing here. And when she saw the tennis courts in Atlanta, she was overwhelmed. She never saw so many tennis courts in in one place and and people that would cheer for her. And when she actually started to play, um, she she really didn't win many points. She, she played um, three matches that day, and, and, and she, she she probably won just a couple of points. But, but um, the next day, um, we had to get up early, and she was ready way before me. Like, our alarm... Um, came off at 6 a.m. And, and I was really trying to open my eyes and when when I came, when I just get, got up and went to the bathroom and came back, she was already dressed with her bow on and with the racket ready to go and, and she said, can we go now? And I wasn't even dressed by then and, and that was such, <laughs> such a, so, so amazing for me because I remember when I was growing up, I always had lots of pressure playing in fact, in fact, I, I remember tournaments where I almost wished the, the, it would rain or something because I was so concerned of whether I was going to win or not. And, and this girl had lost all of her matches the day before, and she really did care. She wanted to go and play again and see her friends. And, and yeah, that was amazing to me. <laughs> and, and just so our listeners know, I mean, this girl is 17 years old. It's not a little kid who, you know, who doesn't get it. I mean, she does have intellectual disabilities, but but she understood that she was there for a tournament and yeah. that yeah. she was competing. I mean, she got it, but you're she saying she got it. <laughs> yeah, but you're saying, I mean, her it was the joy overrode any kind of pressure that she might have felt. Yes, definitely. She, 
um, she was she was very excited. She she would she knew two weeks before that we were going to this tournament, and that already was her main topic for everybody. And then when she was there, she had the best time of her life. And and when she came back, she she keeps telling everybody how how she met these people from other places of the U.S. and how great she played and. And yeah, she she knows what was going on. Definitely. Share with the listeners how she came to meet Josiah and your relationship with Josiah's family and and <laughs> that whole thing that happened. Because I that's that was my favorite part of the day. <laughs> okay, so I um when I was doing my master's here at Montgomery, Alabama, I started to work in the country club just um, just to teach the junior clinics. And my boss was um, Kerry Collins, and uh, he had two, I believe he has four kids who play competitively, competitively. but um, two of them were actually practicing at the club every day. And and I was their hitting partner, and we would play matches. And but then they they moved away to Atlanta because well they got a they got a, um, an important job there, and also their two kids had more more um, ways of practice and getting match practice. They they're kids that are very well national ranked, and so <laughs> when when I took my intellectual disability player to play at this. Um, tournament in Atlanta at the same time there was an, another junior tournament a regular normal tournament going on and so my athlete means Josiah who is the kid that I would practice here with and uh, when I explained her that that um, when I explained her that I would practice with him she just got so emotionally involved with him that she wanted to go and see all of his masters and and was cheering for him like she would know him his whole, her whole life. <laughs> but I mean, one thing that that jumped out at me is one of the matches that that she was watching, and I was sitting with you guys. Um, yeah. Josiah ended up splitting sets, and so he took a break, and and when he came back from his break, um, she told him good luck, and she said, and after you win your match, I'm going to play so you can come cheer for me like I cheered for you during your <laughs> match. <laughs> and, and yes. He, he was so darling about it. I mean, he he said, absolutely, I'll be there, I'll watch you play. And, I mean, this is all going on, and he's just split sets in a match in this big national tournament, and he stopped yeah. and took Time to chat with her for a minute before he had to go start his third set. I I just was so impressed by that. <laughs> yeah, that that was that was me. It 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 comes up this sense of 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 that. I believe everybody has a part in their heart who wants to see other people happy too, and 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 sometimes that it's it's easier to make an intellectual disability person happy and and just by offer them one smile or one word they they already light up a little bit yeah and it's, <laughs> it's obvious too i mean that was the thing like the joy out there was i mean you didn't have to guess if these kids were happy or unhappy or stressed out or nervous you could see just very clearly on their faces and through their actions and through their tone of voice, how much it meant to them just to be there and be with their friends. And even by the end of the first day, um, for your athlete, you know, she she would walk in, that's my friend, that's my friend, that's my friend, and she, <laughs> yes. and she would come across. And it was the coolest thing to see that, you know, that bonding and that um just that connection that happened out there. So I, you yeah. know, I'm a little jealous that you get to experience that every every week with your athletes. That's just such a cool <laughs> thing to do. So, yeah. um, go, go ahead. No, no, I, I, I just said, yeah, it's, it, it is for me. It is nice. It's, it's a challenge to, to start this whole nonprofit and to make sure that it will be sustainable but it's a it's a huge joy to 
to see this to see a change in their lives and and to see that the tennis is making a difference for them. So for our listeners who have kids who might be interested in getting involved in a program like this, what suggestions do you have to the parents in terms of finding a volunteer opportunity for their children? Okay, well, if they if they live in in Montgomery, then to contact me. If if they live in Atlanta, then to contact um, Special Tops. If they live in somewhere else in the U.S., just to Google and and USPA has has programs available, um, and 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 there are other programs throughout the U.S. who who are who are starting to to build this because tennis is just. It's just so good for for adaptive sport because it it is adaptable to every skill level, and that's why it's it's very useful for for an adaptive sport. And, and kids that play tennis in a regular environment would would profit very well from from this program. So just to contact them and see if if it matches their schedule, if it matches their time, and if they could come out and and experience it and, and be a coach. But beyond becoming a coach, they're going to become role models and they're going to become friends for, for people with disabilities. And I think that can have such a profound effect on on our kids in terms of their own confidence and their own self-esteem and, and their maturity. I mean, to feel needed and important is not mm-hmm. something that with children every day. I mean, typically kids are being told by adults what to do and how to do it. This gives them an opportunity to, like you said, become the adult for a little while and and be the leader mm-hmm. and be the teacher. And you know what a what a profound opportunity for them. True, true. Yes, that's exactly right. What you, what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so, if any of our listeners are interested in Making a donation to Dream Court. Tell us how to do that. Um, well, they can go to our online page. It's www.dreamcourt.org, um, and and donate through there, or um, just contact us. And and we 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 are just starting right now, so our online pro- process is not that easy yet. But just mailing a check, or or that would be the best way. And do you have any specific events coming up? Um, well, we uh, we have we are having the fall program now, which is one time one tennis hour every week throughout October and November. But that will be our next Thursday is going to be our next our our last um, our last program, and then. The following Thursday is already Thanksgiving, but we're gonna have a little Christmas party for the for the Dream Court athletes and volunteers in December, and then it's already the holiday time, and we're we're going to start again with our program in end of January or February. Great, and I know Montgomery's weather is kind of like Atlanta's. It's winter time is is kind of questionable for outdoor tennis, so. <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> so, do y'all have plans to try to build a, a covered court at some point, or I mean, are you just gonna kind of see where it all goes? Um, I'm gonna probably see where it all goes. At the moment, there is no indoor court in the whole Montgomery, so so I would think that that would be too much of a luxury to have for a nonprofit that is just starting. Um, but again. Because it has, because the the structure of the practices has to be very organized, and we and we and we need volunteers to participate. We don't, we cannot really at this point go year round. So, so we are doing it in, in in slots. So we had the summer program, and then we had the fall program, and then we might have a, we will have a spring program. But it will be. Um, two months at a time, and then a break, and then again um, two months, and then a little break. That way, that way the 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 volunteers and the organizers can get a little break since it's a nonprofit. 
no no tenant no uh no codes get paid and and that way it's just easier to keep it rolling even though we do want to have a year round experience and so is this fall session is it your first session or did you have a summer session as well we had a summer session yes we did have a a a um summer camp which was the summer camp was a little different. The summer camp was in the morning, and it was every uh, it was an hour every day from Monday through Thursday, and that and we did two weeks in June, two weeks in July, and two weeks and uh, and one week in August. And in that case, most of our volunteers were high school um, high school people. Whereas now in the fall program, the high school people have their own either tennis lessons or their extra activities and so we're mainly using um just people who who can come after work because we are doing it from five thirty to six thirty in the afternoon once a week. Hmm. And and your winter in, program will be the same. Um the winter program we will well we will not have anything in, in December but in the spring in January and February we uh we we will probably include the weekends. We will probably have a session on Saturdays also. That's fantastic. So I mean you're you're growing already even though you haven't even been in existence a whole year yet. Yeah, no. We have not been. I mean, we all, I I had the idea at the end of last year which is when I presented the project to to the city of Montgomery. Um, by by then, I didn't have a visa yet to stay in the U.S., so I went home over Christmas, and I really didn't know whether I had the chance to come back or not. And when I came back in February, at the end of February, I said, here I am, and, and I am going to pursue this. And then they said, fine. Um, in May, we had the kickoff celebration party. In um, July and June, I had raised the money in... Um, July I started the the board and and in August I I presented the papers for the 501c3 so so <laughs> it's all it's all going very fast and but but yeah that's fantastic and your training in order to work with these athletes did you have to take a special coaching course or um, behavioral sciences course, or, or or did you just learn through doing? Well, I I I honestly didn't take any course or any any cert. I did I didn't do any certification yet, although I'm planning to do so. Um, of course, I have all my life played tennis, and I went through so many different coaches that I I, I got this 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 idea of of knowing when to do what already and I have coached for so many years to normal kids already that I have so much idea with tennis. But then through through my volunteering with um special needs organizations in Montgomery and and, and through online I've learned I've learned so much the the USTA and the ITF and and there's so many Google Google programs that you can that you can find online where where you can learn and I just learn by by watching it. That's that's great. Well, Jessica, are there any other stories you want to share with us before we go off the air today? Um. Well, mm, not not exactly a story, but but I just wanted to share again how how much I love tennis and how much i I think tennis is um is so important for for oral people it is it is fun it is a year round sport it is a lifetime sport it it is a fairly an inexpensive sport and and I just would like to grow it in in the u s and in in the world and and um I think that the challenges and the emotions that we experience during tennis matches mirror those we encounter in, in our life. And so I just I just encourage the the parents who have kids that are already playing to just keep pursuing it because it's a great sport that opens many doors and for those parents who have 
kids with disabilities to take it a chance because it might change their lives as well. Well, I'm going to end on that note because that's a fantastic message to share. And thank you so much for being with us. I will have the link to your website posted on Parenting Aces later today so people can take a look at Dream Court and learn more about it. But I encourage all the listeners to take to heart Jessica's messages and, and seek out programs in your community and get involved and get your children involved. Jessica, thank you again for being with us. I wish you all the success, and I look so forward to seeing you next time you make your way to Atlanta. Thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you for having the opportunity to share the story, and hopefully um, people can find us on on, um, on our webpage or when they stop by in Montgomery and see what the Dream Crew is about. And if somebody wants to click on the Facebook page, we would love to have more likes there, too. <laughs> I uh, will add a link to that, too, then. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.